record industry has found a marriage with television. The results are videos, top musical hits put to pictures. Another result is MTV, Music Television, a nationwide cable channel. Want some milk and cookies? No, we want our MTV. Like it or not, this seems to be what American music is coming to. The whole family. The year was 1985 and it resonated with a symphony of groundbreaking musical events that left an indelible imprint on the sonic landscape of the time. It was a year of artistic revolutions and chart-topping triumphs in the world of music. However, something was happening in Africa that would shock and resonate with the entire world. In Ethiopia, seven million people are threatened by starvation. Thousands have already died. The famine caused by drought is the worst in living memory and now the rains have failed again for the third year in succession. The relief organizations are doing all they can but there just isn't enough food to go around. One of the worst hit areas is in the north of the country where the problem has been complicated by two secessionist wars in Eritrea and Tigray. A widespread famine affected Ethiopia from 1983 to 1985. The worst famine to hit the country in a century it affected over 7 million people out of Ethiopia's 38 to 40 million inhabitants and left approximately 300,000 to 1 million dead. Over 2 million people were internally displaced, whereas 400,000 refugees left Ethiopia. But the most shocking part of all this is that almost 200,000 children were orphaned. Suffering, confused, lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. Koram, an insignificant town, has become a place of grief. The relief agencies do what they can. Save the Children Fund are caring for more than 7,000 babies. Every day they weigh them on a sling, then compare their weight with their height. By this rule of thumb, one in three is severely malnourished. According to Human Rights Watch, more than half its mortality could be attributed to human rights abuses causing the famine to come earlier, strike harder, and extend further than would otherwise have been the case. According to the United States Agency for International Development, in the fall of 1984, the hardest hit regions were Tigray, Wolo, and Eritrea, areas with extremely limited road and transportation networks. Moreover, these regions were the scenes of long-standing anti-government rebellions, which created precarious security situations. Other areas of Ethiopia experienced famine for similar reasons, resulting in tens of thousands of additional deaths. The famine as a whole took place a decade into the Ethiopian civil war. Well, in this kind of situation where people are just sitting around, uh, not doing very much, between about sort of 1,000, 1,500 calories would be uh, the minimum, uh, just to keep keep um, keep them ticking over. Um, what does that mean in terms of wheat? Roughly about 500 grams of wheat a day. While all this was happening in Africa, some of the most influential musicians came together to help on any way they could. They were Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, and Quincy Jones. Inspired by the success of Band-Aid's Do They Know It's Christmas project in the UK, Harry Belafonte, an American entertainer and social activist, came up with the idea to organize a song featuring the biggest music artists of the generation. The proceeds from the song would be donated to a newly formed organization called United Support of Artists for Africa, which aimed to provide food and relief aid to people suffering from the famine in Ethiopia resulting in the deaths of over one million people. Belafonte also intended to allocate funds to combat hunger in the United States as well. Belafonte approached Ken Cragen, an entertainment manager and fellow fundraiser, who enlisted the participation of Lionel Richie and Kenny Rogers. To add more star power to the project, Cragen and the two musicians sought the cooperation of Stevie Wonder. Quincy Jones, taking a break from his work on the film The Color Purple, was brought in as a co-producer. Jones then contacted Michael Jackson, who had recently released the highly successful album Thriller and had just finished a tour with his brothers. Jackson expressed his interest in not only singing the song, but also contributing to its writing. Originally, the songwriting team included Wonder, 
But due to his time constraints with songwriting for the film The Woman in Red, Jackson and Ritchie took it upon themselves to write We Are the World. They wanted to create a song that was easy to sing, memorable, and could serve as an anthem. For a week, the two musicians spent every night working on lyrics and melodies in Jackson's bedroom. Latoya Jackson, Michael's older sister, described the process as emotional, mentioning that Michael wrote most of the lyrics but never felt the need to emphasize it. Ritchie had recorded two melodies for the song, which Jackson incorporated by adding music and lyrics on the same day. Jackson worked quickly, surprising both Ritchie and Jones with the completed song, including drums, piano, strings, and chorus. Subsequent meetings between Jackson and Ritchie were unproductive, leading to no additional vocals or progress. It was not until the night of January 21st, 1985, just one night before the first recording session, that Ritchie and Jackson finalized the lyrics and melody of We Are the World within a brief two and a half hours. Similarly, all the way in the UK, the Live Aid concert in 1985 was conceived as a continuation of the successful charity single Do They Know It's Christmas, which was also created by Geldof and Jura. In October 1984, Michael Burke's BBC News reports on the 1984 famine showed images of hundreds of thousands of people dying of starvation in Ethiopia. The BBC News crew was the first to document the famine, and Burke's report described it as a biblical famine in the 20th century and the closest thing to hell on earth. The reports featured Claire Birchinger, a young nurse who had to decide which children would receive limited food supplies in the feeding station and which were too sick to be saved. Geldof referred to her as having the power of life and death, which was unbearable for anyone. Birchinger was traumatized by her experiences and remained silent about them for 20 years, feeling a sense of guilt and questioning why such disparities existed in a time of abundance. The British public was shocked by the report and flooded relief agencies with donations, bringing global attention to the Ethiopian crisis. Burke's report was even broadcast in its entirety on a major U.S. news channel, which was unusual at the time. Geldof, who saw the report from his home in London, reached out to Jura, and together they wrote the song, Do They Know It's Christmas, with the intention of raising money for famine relief. Geldof enlisted colleagues in the music industry to record the single for free under the name Band Aid. The song was recorded on November 25, 1984, released four days later, and became a massive success, raising £8 million instead of the initial expectation of £70,000. Inspired by this success, Geldof aimed to organize a large-scale concert to raise more funds. Um, well, maybe to put you in the mood of the song you're about to sing, which hopefully will save millions of lives i think it's best to remember that the price for life this year is a piece of plastic seven inches wide with a hole in the middle and that i think is an indictment of us and i think what's happening in africa is a crime of historical proportions and the crime is that the western world has got billions of tons of grain bursting in its silos and we're not releasing it to people who are dying of hunger And so the artist selection began with artists such as Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Elton John, David Bowie, Queen, Tina Turner, Madonna, Sade, George Michael, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet, Howard Jones, and many more being chosen to perform. However, one notable name was missing from the Live Aid lineup, and that was none other than Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson at this point in his life was one of the biggest stars on the planet, so why did he not perform at Live Aid? There are a number of reasons why Michael Jackson didn't perform at Live Aid, so we will aim to paint a picture of the most likely reasons for this outcome. The first issue was scheduling conflict. One of the primary reasons for Michael Jackson's absence from Live Aid was a scheduling conflict. During the same period, Jackson was heavily engaged in his highly successful victory tour with his brothers. The tour, which commenced on July 6, 1984, and ended on December 9, 1984, spanned 55 concerts across North America. 
Given the extensive commitments and logistical challenges associated with the tour, it is understandable that Jackson was unable to participate in Live Aid, which took place on July 13, 1985, almost eight months after the tour concluded. The second possible reason was artistic control and creative vision. Michael Jackson was known for his meticulous attention to detail and his desire for artistic control over his performances. Live Aid, being a large-scale event with multiple artists, would have limited the amount of creative control Jackson had over his performance. Given his reputation for elaborate stage productions and precise choreography, it is possible that Jackson preferred to perform in a controlled environment where he could tailor every aspect to his liking. Hence, he may have chosen to prioritize his own concerts, where he had complete control over the production. Michael's press agent, Norman Winter, released a statement at the time saying that Jackson was working around the clock in the studio on a project that he's made a major commitment to, and consequently could not free up sufficient time to rehearse and perform at Live Aid. Winter added, Michael is just about living in the studio, rehearsing and recording. I know, what could be more major than Live Aid? But Michael couldn't turn his back on his responsibility to the people he's working with. This affected employment for a lot of people. This could be alluding to the fact that Michael was working on his bad album during this time. Another issue might have been political and social concerns. Another factor that may have influenced Jackson's decision was his reluctance to be associated with certain political and social aspects surrounding the Live Aid concert. At the time, Live Aid aimed to raise funds for famine relief in Ethiopia, drawing attention to the humanitarian crisis. However, Jackson was known for his support of a wide range of charitable causes and may have preferred to exercise his philanthropic efforts through his own initiatives, allowing him to maintain control over the allocation of resources and messaging. The next issue might have been distance and prior commitments. Considering Michael Jackson's status as a global superstar, his absence from Live Aid may also be attributed to the geographical distance and prior commitments. Live Aid was held in London, England and Philadelphia, USA simultaneously. With Jackson being an American artist, the logistical challenges of coordinating his presence at both venues, considering his touring schedule and other commitments, might have been insurmountable. While Michael Jackson's absence from Live Aid remains a notable aspect of the event's history, multiple factors likely contributed to his decision not to perform. The combination of scheduling conflicts, the desire for artistic control, potential political and social concerns, and the challenges of distance and prior commitments could have influenced Jackson's decision. Despite his absence, Jackson's contributions to charitable causes throughout his career remain significant, and his legacy as a performer and philanthropist endures. Live Aid stands as a monumental event that left a mark on the world. With its unprecedented reach and scale, the concert not only raised an extraordinary amount of money for famine relief in Africa, but also served as a catalyst for a global awakening of compassion and social activism. Live Aid demonstrated the power of music to unite people across borders, cultures, and backgrounds in a shared mission to alleviate suffering. Beyond the immediate financial aid provided, its legacy continues to inspire individuals, artists, and organizations to leverage their platforms for positive change. By igniting a sense of collective responsibility, Live Aid proved that when humanity joins forces, we have the ability to tackle even the most daunting challenges, fostering a world where empathy and action prevail.